everyone. Let's just set the timer on. Uh, have I still got the same time allocation as all done? 25 minutes. Is all done? Yeah. 25 yeah. minutes, yeah. Okay. Look. So, that's me, Paul Morris, Business Development Manager for a company called Fenexia from the Czech Republic. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about voice biometrics, a slightly different slant on what you've already been hearing today. Um, but I guess in some small way connected to what we just heard um, in terms of security. Let's dive in and I'm going to start with a short audio excerpt for you to take a look at. Okay, so uh, a short audio extract there, and basically what the extract does is show you the majority of the technologies that um, we actually develop um, and sell. So what you've seen there uh, is identification of the language, you've seen there some sort of an age estimation, uh, gender, uh, we've seen the topic according to possible keyword identification. We've had, um, we've had a real-time speech transcription, speech-to-text transcription, um, and obviously um, the consent check and ID check are standard parts of contact centre etiquette and compliance. So, yeah, this has been a demonstration of what the company Fenexia has been doing um, since its inception back in 2006. So, what I want to do today is give you a bit of an overview about Fenexia. I want to give you also an overview about the uh, technologies that we develop. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit more about the commercial use cases, um, give some examples of how things work now, and also try and give you um, some information on how we think things could work within a call or contact centre environment using our um, future product solution, tentatively called Voice Verify. Okay, so the, no the motto of the company Phoenix is turning voice into knowledge. Now, I don't claim that Phoenix is the only company doing this around the world. Obviously, there are a lot of different vendors doing similar things to us in a different, larger, or smaller scale. Nonetheless, so we are at the Czech Republic. We're from Brno, so a couple of hours from here, uh, along one of the most awful motorways you're probably likely to find in Europe. Um, just over 50 people, so a relatively small organisation, flexible, agile organisation. A private company, so it's owned by five owners, all of whom actually started their careers at the Technical University in Brno, where since the year 2000 there's been a, a dedicated speech technology research group, and in fact that's how the uh, company grew. After five or six years of uh, their activities they decided it might be a nice idea to try and make a bit of money out of it. Um, we're active worldwide, so um, when I say worldwide, I'm talking around about 60 countries across the globe where you can find our technologies deployed. Um, I think you'll have cottoned on by now that the, the parts of the world labelled uh, orange are where you can find our technologies. Um, the majority of our business is actually done within the government sector, so perhaps not relevant to, to the majority of you here. Um, so we do a lot of our work for... Uh, surveillance or intelligence, police forces, ministries, etc, etc. But we are looking to move more in, into the commercial space. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm here today. So, um, there's just a small selection of some of our clients and partners. We've doctored it a little bit to try and show a few more commercial references that we have. Uh, you can see on there that we also have some quite, um, quite interesting uh, references in the government sector. Bundeskriminalamt, the German FBI, but as said, we do want to move more into the commercial sector, 
hence the development of this new more off-the-shelf solution which I'll talk about a little, a little bit more later. It's a B2B model. Um, I've tried to mention some end customers there, but then we've got outfits like Comdata, SAS, Dimension Data, who are, let's say, uh, integrators, and they're the kind of companies who do a lot of our work through. But let's crack on. So, what am I here to talk about? Well, it's the Phoenixis Speech Platform. What is it? Well, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a single platform of state-of-the-art speech technologies. They're all developed in-house, so we're not providing any third-party solutions. This is all written in-house by our team of developers, and we also work with the Technical University. Anyhow, the speech engine. Number of different technologies. What I want to do is quickly take you through the technologies um, that we offer and give you some idea of, of, of what we do. So we start with some rapid pre-filtering technologies. So we'll receive an audio in a wave file typically, but there are other uh, OPEC and some other uh, some other um, formats that we can, can use. Um, speech quality estimation will tell us whether the audio is of a sufficient quality to be analysed and the voice activity detection will tell us whether there is any net speech to be analysed. What's important for us is to have speech. So we're not working with gunshots, we're not, we're not working with um, non-verbal utterances and general noises, screams, but we're actually working with um, speech and that's, that's important to say. Diarization, means that we can receive an audio whether there are one or more speakers uh, speaking and we can actually take that audio, split it into its separate parts and then perform the analysis on those separate parts, so i.e. on those separate individuals hopefully. Language identification, you saw that I think in the demonstration, so we currently can identify over 60 languages across the globe. Um, for Arabic for example we can identify up to six dialects of Arabic um, we cover a range of African languages, a range of Asian languages. Gender ID, self-explanatory I would say. Um, I don't know whether the Trans Species Society would come under um, that. It might be a little bit difficult to do uh, that identification. That, by the way, was a fantastic presentation and I thought, well, it's going to be pretty difficult to, to meet those standards um, later on. So, age estimation. Important to say we're only talking about age estimation. We can't say accurately, specifically, how old a person is, but we can say plus minus seven years with around about 95 degrees certainty. Um, speaker ID, this is the flagship technology, the biometric technology I want to cover a little bit later on um, because I think that's the, that's the real key behind our activities in the commercial sector. STT, you saw that, the speech to text. Again, we cover around about 15 languages there, nowhere near as many as the language ID. Uh, the reasons are very simple. If you want to build a strong speech transcription model and indeed a keyword spotting model, you need a vast amount of data. You're probably talking about 100 hours at least of annotated speech to build a very strong model. In addition to that, of course, um, you might have models you want to build very specifically for certain verticals, for certain um, subject areas, which makes it even more, let's say, um, rigorous. And then we have a denoising de tool which will clean sound up for the for the listener. So those are the technologies that you'll find within um, our speech engine. But I want to return to the speaker identification. The reason is very simple. Um, this is the identification which is, let's say, the flagship of our biometrics technologies. We have the other technologies I, I mentioned, like the speech transcription, the, the keyword spotting, which are sort of analytics tools. But, but this one here is really the key one, um, not only for government, but it will also become more and more important uh, within the commercial sphere. And indeed, it's something that's already being provided by some other um, voice technology vendors. So, speech identification. When I talk about speech identification, I'm talking predominantly about... Um, the voice biometrics. It's very straightforward, it's not really rocket science unless you want to go really deep, which I'm not going to do, to be perfectly frank. Um, so really, um, what is it? Well, it's straightforward enough. It's each one of us here within this room, each individual has their own voice print. In the same way that we have each of us our own fingerprint, um, to a certain degree, uh, iris print, etc. When it comes to um, the level of security that you can obtain from voice biometrics, it's pretty high. I mean, this is something that is extremely hard to imitate. Our, our solution won't be fooled um, by any kind of synthesis of voices. Uh, generally speaking, it won't be fooled by illness. So illness can have an effect on a person's voice, certainly. 
Um, and it may make the authentication or the verification of the voice print a little longer. It may take a little longer to actually verify conclusively, but it will nonetheless uh, be done. So you can't fool it. Illness won't fool it, generally speaking. Um, I have received a question a little bit earlier today related to uh, impairment. So let's say post-op impairment of a voice. What would the situation be there? Well, I mean, in that situation, you would probably have to go and do a new voice enrolment and create a new voice print. There is always that element there, of course. So, how does it work? It's fairly simple. Um, the voice is enrolled. The voice print is created. The voice print will go into a database. Um, and then that voice print will be the reference point um, for later on when trying to identify the individual. We can be talking about one-to-one -one, uh, comparisons, so we have a particular individual in mind uh, and we can identify them, or we could be talking about a one-to-n comparison, so more a case of speaker spotting if we're talking about, let's say, thousands <coughs> of different voice prints, perhaps even millions uh, of voice prints within a large intelligence platform um, or surveillance operation. But, as I said before, um, we're not the only company in the world that's providing voice biometrics. There are a lot of others around, um, a lot of larger companies around. But I have to say, um, obviously completely objectively, that we do have the best voice biometrics engine around um, on the market at the moment. That revolution, we can call it revolution, I think, took place uh, earlier this year um, when we released the first um, wholly uh, DNN-based biometrics, uh, voice biometrics solution on the market. So you can see there, uh, it's speaker identification um, generation four. We gave it the mark, trademark of deep embeddings. Um, and as mentioned, it uses purely deep neural networks. There is no kind of IVEC technology involved now. You'll find other solutions around that kind of are a hybrid perhaps of IVEC and some elements of DNN, but we're purely DNN. The benefits of DNN are very clear. They're all on the screen in front of you. Um, in terms of the speed uh, that it can process the audio, um, it's four times faster than iVector. So whereas with iVector, you, uh, you had 20 times faster than real-time processing. So for example, within one day, you were able to process 480 hours um, of audio. Um, we go four times that, so what's that? just over 1,900 hours of audio we can process in, in one day. Um, in terms of the accuracy, the accuracy has been improved significantly using the new deep embeddings. Um, you'll notice there that we, we used a NIST data set. We heard NIST mentioned earlier in one of the uh, presentations, I believe, by a uh, gentleman from, that's it, over at University of Malta. That's right. So we also, uh, we work with NIST. We've taken part in a number of the um, let's say competitions or Olympics for want of a better word where uh, the task was to actually uh, you know, analyze some files and use the most efficient technology possible um, and we rate very highly on the NIST list so against the likes of Mellon Carnegie and other organizations around the world so we have a very good track record as well. But uh, that's, all, that's all well and good, you know, that, that sounds nice but these are really the figures which are important for um, the partner and indeed the end user in the end. So, um, if we talk about speech signal for enrolment, previously with iVector-based technology, and this will be the case for some other vendors still, since they're working on this basis, it used to be you'd need something like 35 seconds of minimum speech signal to be able to enrol uh, an individual. We've managed to cut that down to a mere 20 seconds now, which represents a significant um, time saving and ultimately uh, cost saving and efficiency increase, not only in the government sector, but probably even more significantly um, in the commercial sector. And I, I will come back to that in a little bit. And also key as well is the, the figure at the bottom where we've actually been able to reduce the minimum speech signal required for identification of a caller from 10 seconds to 7 seconds. Now, it may not seem particularly significant, but then again, if you're dealing with uh, an average contact centre which might be processing something like 5,000 calls a day and any of you who have used um, internet banking or uh, telephone banking, sorry, uh, in Central Europe at least, will know that it can be a, a, a bit of a pain in the backside sometimes. And not just banking but also, for example, um, other non-banking financial institutes where uh, you will have to repeat a series of questions or answers to a series of questions 
over and over and over again, potentially in one day if you've got a real um, annoying issue where you're having to repeatedly call into the bank, you will have to answer those questions repeatedly. And don't forget, you will more than likely be speaking to a different individual um, each time. So that is, um, so if we take like 5,000 calls in a day, if you can save at least that amount of time within a call centre, then that can re represent a significant saving over the course of a half year or a year. Okay, so those are, those are the key differences um, between our new voice biometrics technology and what is the, the market standard. Now, commercial use cases. I'm going to focus on the speaker identification because it's becoming more and more relevant these days um, for banks to try and find ways to become more attractive, to improve the customer experience. Um, not only that, to also improve the agent experience um, and to increase security. Our kinds of technologies are already being used in the commercial sector, but more along the lines of the analytics tools. So, for example, you know, we can give, we can, we can provide the raw data to create demographic information about who's calling it. Uh, is it more male, female? Is it per people of a certain, uh, certain age group? Uh, is it predominantly, let's say, one ethnic group perhaps calling in? Um, different things like that. So those tools are already in use in the commercial sector. But we're now looking to create something a little bit more uh, end user friendly. I mentioned before our speech engine with all of the different technologies. Those are technologies that have to be, let's say, integrated usually via REST API by a third party organization. What we're looking to do now is create something uh, more attuned to the end user that can just be, let's say, plugged into a, a standard contact center uh, system platform like Genesis via people like this. So the commercial use cases, let's take a, a real bog standard, um, a bog standard uh, scenario as it is now within a call center. So you're calling in, um, they're probably going to ask you for a PIN number. Um, it's quite likely since most contact centers want some sort of multi-layer authentication, at least in terms of the questions they'll ask you, one question is not enough. So they'll go ahead and ask probably a mother's maiden name, that's one I, I quite often get. Smith, and then it could even be that that's not enough for them. They want something a little bit more specific, and this is obviously a ridiculous example, but, you know, something along the lines of your f a favourite question. You know, what's your favourite football team? Um, Tottenham Hotspur, by the way. And, um, you know, by that stage, uh, you've answered three questions. You've probably wasted something. You've probably wasted a good amount of time on the phone already with the agent, perhaps half a minute, um, and you finally manage to actually start talking about the issue that you have. So that's kind of authentication in today's environment. Now what we're doing is, and again, I want to stress that this is not, we're not the first company to do this. There are other uh, vendors of voice technologies who are doing something uh, similar already. You'll find installations in Central Europe, for example. There's a large Slovak bank. Anyone here from Slovakia may know that Tatra Bank is using some kind of um, deployment like this with, with other technology. There are banks in the UK, Barclays, I believe, Lloyd's, who are also using something similar, Czech or in the Czech Republic. Nonetheless, our idea is simply this. <clears throat> You're calling, and there will obviously be the multi-layer of authentication as well. So again, it will be a question of please tell me your PIN. The same questions, but... There we go. So you're going, at least at this first stage, when the enrolment is taking place, yes, you're having to go through the questions as a customer, but what's happening in the background, so free speech, free speech enrolment, is that our software is working in the background and creating that voice print. So here, during this conversation, we're gathering that 20 seconds of net speech of the customer and creating that unique voice print, which is then going into the database. So you don't avoid the customer is still having that awful experience which he has every time he calls into the contact centre. But what he doesn't realise, although he will when he's given that automatic message that his voice has been recorded for enrolment purposes, is he okay with that? Then um, that will make his next customer experience far more pleasant because he's not having to go through any of those questions again. He's simply calling in. Um, and once he is on the line, his voice is being authenticated. His voice is, buying, is being verified. His identity is being verified. So he's within the space of five to seven seconds. The agent here on the left-hand side, he's getting a sign telling him, green light, verified, this person is good to go. I'm just checking the old 
How am I doing? Because I actually forgot the stopwatch. There you go. Um, so, he has been authorised and the agent is good to go. It could be that, of course, the line doesn't reach into the green uh, straight away, so it might be that, in addition, there may have to be some additional questions. But generally speaking, um, the system is very uh, reliable and it will reach that green line within, within the, the allotted seven seconds. So, talking to a number of different banks, and these are banks in Jordan, in Austria, in Slovakia, in the UK, it's interesting that most of them come back with the same, with the same numbers. They talk about a typical contact centre duration of three minutes. Now, if you can imagine that within that three minutes, uh, most of them will spend something like 45 to seconds to one minute on average, actually with authentication quite often. So what we're able to do is to cut that down by um, a good 20 or more seconds, translate that into 5,000 calls a day, and actually the call centre can save unnecessary call time of up to 28 hours worth of call per day. That's a significant saving in terms of time, and obviously, as I said before, the knock-on, the financial effect. But there I was talking mainly uh, about speaker identification. But there's also the fraud detection element as well which is a slightly different thing. In terms of the fraud detection, we're talking about two main use cases. So the first use case would be um, a contact center which is processing calls coming in from outside. And essentially what you've got there are people impersonating, imitating a customer. There could be various reasons. They're simply fishing for information. They want to make some unauthorized transactions. They want to get some money. They could be phoning for any variety of reasons. But the key thing is it is someone impersonating a customer calling into a contact center. However, more and more we see now cases of social engineering, so what you've got people imitating, somehow getting hold of telephone numbers, internal numbers within a large organisation, large corporation, and then they're calling through to various departments <coughs> within that organisation, typically an IT department, and they're actually trying to gain access to also sensitive information, or indeed just simply gaining access to some internal networks within the organisation, using precisely the same techniques. Of course, what the, te the technology can do, let me just go back quickly, what the technology can do, it, the, the principle is the same as with external callers. So the company will have a database of voice prints for all its internal employees, and again, via uh, deployment of our solution, uh, they will be able to call or they will be able to um, be informed during the call whether it is a rogue caller or not. Put in very simplistic layman's terms. In terms of the solution itself, as mentioned before, it should be an off-the-shelf solution. Deployment time, well, deployment time, if we go right from the beginning of the deployment through to the end of it, we're probably talking about several weeks, but if I put that into comparison against some of our larger competitors from over the, uh, from over the ocean, where deployment can take anything up to four to six months, then I think the deployment time for our solution is, is more than palatable. Calibration, there's automatic calibration as well, and again, with some of the uh, competitor solutions around for voice biometrics of this type, the calibration is not at all automatic, and indeed, that's what tends to lengthen the deployment time significantly. Uh, and last but not least, the installation itself, uh, on-premise or in the cloud. Um, we find from at least um, the banking experiences so far that most of the interest is to have an on-premise solution just for increased levels of security. We're used to working with on-premise solutions from the government sector. So there is a final overview, the last slide, just to re-emphasize again the benefits of what a solution like Phonexia Voice Authentication or Voice Verify can bring to a commercial organization. Authentication on calls cut by over 20 seconds, uh, improved layer of security, so it's an additional very, very solid and robust layer of security um, to uh, aid the prevention of fraud, and also an improvement in the user experience, uh, as there is no need to remember answers to reams and reams and reams of questions. So, if you're interested, feel free to come and see me after the presentation. Um, there's my email, there's my Skype, Go onto our website, see if you want to find some more information. And uh, thanks very much for your time, and thank you. Bye-bye.